Hey everyone, several of my subscribers asked me to weigh in on the matter of the National Day of Prayer. Uh, the federal statute establishing it was recently ruled unconstitutional by Judge Barbara Crabb of the United States District Court for the Western District of Wisconsin in the case Freedom from Religion Foundation v. Obama and Gibbs. There is a link to the decision in the description box below, and anyone interested in this matter should read the decision. Uh, it's very well reasoned and firmly grounded in the Constitution, specifically the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment and relevant Supreme Court court precedent. In a nutshell, Judge Crabb ruled that because the National Day of Prayer statute lacked a secular purpose, indeed the law's only purpose was for the federal government in the person of the president to encourage and facilitate a religious exercise, namely prayer. Uh, so because the statute lacked a secular purpose, it violated the Establishment Clause and therefore was not a valid law. And Judge Crabb is absolutely right here. Um, I'll begin with some background because there's a ton of misinformation and even disinformation about this out there. Then I'll review the decision. And finally, I'll talk about what Judge Crabb's decision does not do. Namely, it does not take away anyone's religious liberty. Everyone in the United States is free to pray if and when he or she wants to. You don't need the government to do it. Okay, first background. The National Day of Prayer statute that was struck down is the progeny of a federal law that was enacted 58 years ago in April 1952. The 1952 statute provided, quote, the president shall set aside and proclaim a suitable day each year other than a Sunday as a national day of prayer on which the people of the United States may turn to God in prayer and meditation at churches, in groups, and as individuals. This was one of several federal laws enacted in the 1950s, largely in reaction to the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, Senator Absalom Robertson of Virginia introduced the legislation in the United States Senate. Um, by the way, Senator Robertson was, among other things, the father of Pat Robertson and a segregationist, as so many Christians from the American South were. Uh, Senator Robertson said the National Day of Prayer law was intended to battle, quote, the corrosive forces of communism, which seek simultaneously to destroy our democratic way of life and the faith in an almighty God on which it is based. You know, perhaps one day someone will introduce me to the almighty God who is a proponent of democracy. None of the purportedly almighty gods with which I'm familiar is presented as a proponent of democracy in the relevant holy books. Two years later, in 1954, the United States national motto was changed from A Pluribus Unum to In God We Trust. In 1955, a statute was enacted requiring In God We Trust to appear on all American money. Uh, then, in 1956, the words Under God were added to the Pledge of Allegiance. As one of the sponsors of the pledge legislation in the House of Representatives said, quote, The unbridgeable gap between America and communist Russia is belief in Almighty God. You know, advocates of these Cold War laws should probably come out of their bunkers because, among other things, the Cold War is over. The original National Day of Prayer statute was also a response to a call for such a day by Reverend Billy Graham uh, during a six-week religious campaign in Washington, D.C. in 1952. Uh, Reverend Graham declared, quote, Our nation was founded upon God, religion, and the church. We have dropped our pilot, the Lord Jesus Christ, and are sailing blindly on without divine chart or compass. Sound familiar? American evangelical religious rhetoric and mangling of the Republic's history hasn't changed much, if at all, in 58 years. In 1988, 36 years after the original statute was enacted, the National Day of Prayer Committee, a private group, and the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ lobbied Congress to amend the law. Uh, they wanted it to set a specific day every year for the National Day of Prayer in order to facilitate planning and scheduling of events. Coincidentally, the amendment was introduced in the Senate by yet another segregationist from the South, namely Strom Thurmond of South Carolina. 
The 1988 amendment passed Congress and was signed into law by President Reagan in May 1988. It provided, quote, the president shall issue each year a proclamation designating the first Thursday in May as a national day of prayer on which the people of the United States may turn to God in prayer and meditation at churches, in groups, and as individuals. Um, Harry Truman and every president since has issued an annual proclamation of a national day of prayer pursuant to the statute. Um, every president since Ronald Reagan has issued a proclamation designating the first Thursday in May as the national day of prayer, including President Obama, uh, one of the defendants in the lawsuit under review here. This year it will take place on May 6th. In 1989, the National Day of Prayer Task Force, a private organization, was established, quote, to encourage participation in the National Day of Prayer, to communicate with every individual the need for personal repentance and prayer, to create appropriate materials, and to mobilize the Christian community to intercede for America's leaders and its families. The task force's work is, quote, based on its understanding that this country was birthed in prayer and its reverence for the God of the Bible. The task force is chaired by Shirley Dobson, spouse of James Dobson, founder of the conservative evangelical Family Research Council and Focus on the Family, at whose headquarters the National Day of Prayer Task Force is located. The task force's membership list is a veritable who's who of America's Christian right. In a statement on the task force's website, link in the description box, Mrs. Dobson denounces Judge Crabb's decision as, quote, outrageous. She declares, quote, what arrogance from an unelected and unaccountable member of the bench. Apparently, Mrs. Dobson hasn't read the Federalist Papers, particularly Federalist Number 78, in which Alexander Hamilton wrote, that federal judges have, quote, the duty to declare all acts contrary to the Constitution void, and that without an independent judiciary, in Mrs. Dobson's lingo, unelected and unaccountable judges, the provisions in and rights protected by the Constitution, quote, would amount to nothing. But why should what the framers of the Constitution said get in the way of Mrs. Dobson and her Christian right rhetoric, right? She and her ilk seem no more concerned about the facts of American history and constitutional law than they are about Jesus' instructions to his followers about prayer. When you pray, go into your inner room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. So, what's the problem here? Um, as many people have opined, including a number of friends of mine, uh, the president's annually calling upon Americans to pray seems innocuous and inconsequential in the grand constitutional scheme. While it may seem that way, uh, one must keep in mind that ours is a precedential system, and in such a system, a seemingly innocuous and inconsequential violation of the Constitution can become the basis for far more significant violations in the future. As the Supreme Court put it in the 1971 case Lemon v. Kurtzman, quote, some steps become the platform for yet further steps. A certain momentum develops in constitutional theory, and it can be a downhill thrust, easily set in motion, but difficult to retard or stop. Development by momentum is not invariably bad, but it is a force to be recognized and reckoned with. The dangers are increased by the difficulty of perceiving in advance exactly where the verge of the precipice lies. Constitutional scholar Kenneth Karst put it this way in his article, The First Amendment, the Politics of Religion, and the Symbols of Government, quote, Each judicial approval of a de facto establishment of religion adds to the fund of precedence for the next extension of official support for religion. And I'll pick this up in part two.